Okay, we are recording. Great. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, we are uh, meeting for the uh, May 26th special meeting of the Weathersfield Town Council. Uh, again, in accordance with the governor's executive order, we are virtually meeting again. It seems like I've seen all of your faces more in the last three weeks than I have my family. Um, I consider most of you an extension of my family right now. So, um, same here, Mike. Same here. <laughs> without further ado, I'll go right to the uh, agenda. Um, as you all see, uh, former councilman, former deputy mayor Dan O'Connor uh, has joined us um, as a participant, but, uh, soon to be appointed member to the um, town council. Um, can I get a motion to appoint Dan O'Connor? as a member of the Weathersfield Town Council. Sure, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to officially nominate Dan O'Connor to join the Town Council. Um, I've actually known Dan for, for most of my life. And um, in addition to my father, they were actually uh, growing up were the biggest influences and, and inspirations in, in me wanting to serve and give back to the community. Um, he brings a, an experience that I know every member of this council will definitely benefit from. So uh, please join me in welcoming him to the council. Thank you, Pat. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mary. Dolores, it was a uh, motion by yeah. you. got them both. You can see it? Yes, I know. Yeah, Pat and uh, Mary. Great. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Dan. We look forward to your expertise. Uh, we're in the, the final stretches of the, um, the budget, and I know you'd sat through many a budget negotiation. You and I have talked personally offline a number of times on uh, on ways we can uh, um, look for efficiencies as well as uh, um, increased services uh, throughout town so welcome we look forward to uh, to hearing some of your advice as we move forward uh, it's not the best situation right now with what's going on around us but it is a, uh, um, a situation that I think uh, not only the, uh, the residents of Weathersfield expect us to to work on on behalf of the, themselves, but we also expect ourselves to uh, dig a little bit deeper and, and you know work a little bit harder to be able to uh, to get through these next couple of days. So, thank you. Thank hey, you, uh, Mike. You might want to officially make him motion. a counselor by voting. Oh yeah. Motion. I, I mean, <laughs> oh. I know the motion. The second's close. It's close, but you know, there's a thing. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Uh, I like Dan made. too. <laughs> the motion has been made and seconded. Uh, to appoint Dan O'Connor to the council. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Yes. Sure. Thank Dan's you a well. good guy. I, we've hey, worked on a you, lot man. of good projects. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Patrick, as well. Great. Would you like him to be sworn in? Sure. sure please. <laughs> Dan, can you raise your right hand, please? And you can repeat after me. I, Dan O'Connor, swear. I, Dan O'Connor, swear. I will faithfully discharge my duties. I will faithfully discharge my duties. As a member of the Town Council of Wethersfield. As a member of the Town Council of Wethersfield. According to the laws of the Constitution of the United States. According to the laws of the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Connecticut. The Constitution of the State of Connecticut. And to the Weathersfield Town Charter. And to the Weathersfield Town Charter. To the best abilities, of, so help me God. To the best abilities, so help me God. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you. Okay. Mike, I, um, had a, I had a 40 minute speech. Do you want me to start now? <laughs> Right oh, Dan, I miss you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, you're coming in during a COVID pandemic. What do you think about that? <laughs> I know. I'm not really sure. I'll let you know at the end of this. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gary, how do you want to start this with the questions that were posed? and answer some of those that kind of gives us are, are these some of these questions were they asked at the last thursday's budget workshop as well or uh, deliberations or are these all emailed in 
Uh, I think most of those were emailed in. I think, uh, and I may be wrong, I might have already answered the one previously, but we can start with those. And then um, if there's anything that I had missed, um, and I have another list, we could probably do both, just in case I missed something. Um, why don't we start with that list and then the more the most recent email and then we can work backwards back to thursdays that included additional information from mike is that the one yeah unless you want to start with those whichever ones why don't we start with those they were days ago and one second I just get a little feedback here all right, so you want to start with the older ones. Look at all the birds. Yeah, who's lucky enough to be outside right now? Oh, I am. Okay. So I will start, why don't we start with the oldest first then, which would be Thursday. So the others are, the first one was historical tax collection rates, general wage increases, budgeted salaries by position, and then the year to date budget report. That's one of the sets. And then the next set is related to the fund balance. So whichever one you'd prefer, I can run through that number again. Uh, you, let's see. You got them up on the screen. Can you put them up as a yep. screen share? Hang on one second. Got to load. <coughs> Okay, I just want to double check that says Town of Weathersfield, Connecticut property tax rates. That's what I'm looking at. Table seven. Yep. Yep. I don't know if you can see that okay. Yep. And we had asked for this because Berkeley, where we had number 90, 916, we're hovering right around 99. We dropped down to 90, 98, 96. Lowest was, yeah, 2011. Was that coming off of the 2000? 2019 crash we were kind of rebuilding so we you might have been around at that time as finance director but do we have any data to that low of a number what fluctuation mayor uh 2000 2011 to 2014, and then we started to go back up. Ah, hang on. I'm going to try to move this around and make it more visible. Mike, wasn't the 2011, the 9-11, and then the market crash? No, that was... No, no, no. This would have been after. Before that. <laughs> right. I can't believe I've been gone 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that would have done it as well. Yeah, it did. I'm it. just probably looking at revenue shortfalls. You're looking right here, right? Yeah. You're saying 98.79. That's probably your lowest. So you figure <laughs> neighborhood stabilization program came out 09, pretty much hitting in 2010. So you would have been the tail end of the crash. Yep. Yeah. Could have been it. Okay. And have you talked to Marlene at all? How are we looking for tax collections right now? I know I'd spoken to her about a completely separate issue. And she said, you know, 
despite everything, people are still paying their taxes. Yeah, we'll have our number for this year. 99.1. We're at about 99.1. Yeah, and we're seeing, you know, if you want to just talking about the last month, month and a half, um, it's Marlene's belief that some of the stability she's seeing in collections is because of the reduced interest rate on delinquent balances. You know, that was part of the, you know, the governor's executive order. Uh, the council decided to uh, adopt the re reduced interest rate for 90 days. For delinquent balances, that applies um, for April, May, and June. So we're, we're in the midst of that period where delinquent taxpayers with delinquent balances can take advantage of that. So okay. she, she surmises that that is probably uh, contributing to, you know, again, what, you know, where collections are, are relatively um, nominal, minimal at this time of year, but she, we're not seeing any, any drop off from kind of the patterns we've seen in past years. And um, I believe she's at her mark now. You know, I think we've, I think we've hit budget. You know, I know she's hit her collection rate, and I think we've hit what we budgeted on the levy too. Okay. Um, are we comfortable, or are you comfortable, Mike, looking at increasing what we had budgeted for, and I believe it was ninety-eight. Six five and moving that up, or what are your thoughts on keeping it at a lower collection rate? So uh, two years ago, really last year, not not the current year fiscal twenty, but last fiscal year fiscal nineteen, our assumed rate was ninety eight point six five. When the council adopted the budget last year. We looked at this same historical information and um, there was a decision made to increase the assumption from 98.65 to 99.1 for fiscal, that's for the fiscal 20 budget, the current budget. The budget mm -hmm. you're looking at, the proposed budget, we have taken that collect, assumed collection rate back down to 98.65. Again, just given given the circumstances, you know, when we put it together and the uncertainty um, of of what we face over the next year or so, um, you know, again, I think the historical numbers support you know recent years. But if, if you know, again, looking back over however many years this is, you know, we don't see anything below that ninety eight point seven nine. So. Um, we felt it was at least reasonable to drop back to where we were in 19. Mayor, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, Mike O'Neill, what would happen if we did uh, increase that back to uh, the 99.1 and then we didn't reach that benchmark? That would assume that we would realize more dollars from uh, based on the grand list, so it reduces the mill. It would reduce the mill rate. That's the mechanical effect that that has. You change, you change. See, we only assume we're going to collect in this case with the proposed budget ninety eight point six five percent of the levy. Um, so we increase the mill rate accordingly to ensure that there's sufficient funding in place from the levy to pay for the, the budgeted expenditures. Right. So if we decide to increase that number back to the 99.1% collection rate, and then we fall short of that collection rate, what is the impact of that on the budget? You're below, but it's a negative below shortfall. Yeah, it's a negative budget variance on revenues. You know, so if you're if you're under in total on revenues, um, it's a you know whatever that deficiency is 
on the revenue side rolls to uh, fund balance. So if you were if you were under your budgeted revenues by a hundred thousand dollars, mechanically when you close your books at the end of the year, that would reduce fund balance by a hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Okay. And, and Marlene is saying that we're comfortable with receiving revenue, tax revenue right now, taxpayers are paying because of the penalty reduction, people are, are comfortable being able to pay their property taxes, not only, maybe not on time, but fully by the end of October? No, we have no idea. No. That's just a hypothesis. We have no way of knowing what the, you know, what the intentions of the taxpayers are in terms of making their payments. So to be safe, we dropped it back to 98.6 rather than keeping it up to 99 or above with the assumption that there may be a reduction. So we're taking that into account, focusing on revenues. Okay. It seems like you'd be hard pressed to say that when people have lost their job, they would be in a better position to pay taxes. No, but I would like to get a better handle on, you know, talking to some folks, the senior population are already paying their property taxes. Those with mortgages are paying through escrow. The commercial, are we... Are we nervous about commercial property paying their property taxes at all? Mike or Gabe? Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer. I mean, I'm, I'm always nervous on that fact, um, regardless of the economy, but there's something to be said about the domino effect related over the last 60 days over executive orders that are in place that allow people to push off their rent. Um, at the same time, the federal government through the CARES Act and even the state um, tried to counteract some of that. So I do anticipate there'll be some kind of pressure on the market. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, you don't know the financial position of these uh, property owners. They, they, on the commercial side, they might have the wherewithal to be able to come forward and pay even if their um, their tenants really aren't yet. So I think we're yet to realize the actual impact on the market. And again, I think that's why we look at that 98.6 number simply because you know you can't you can't really know. Um, when you look at historically, and I'm just kind of looking to the side, our lowest being 98.79 um, even during the housing crash, um, never really dropping significantly. Um, I think you're hedging your bets appropriately. Um, again, you, you don't know. We don't know what the next 12 months are going to bring. We're starting to bring the economy back online slowly. Very concerned about waves, obviously, but I, I think we have to pick a number somewhere. I don't know if I'd go lower than 98.6, 98.5. Um, the question... You know, I, I'd be concerned going higher at this point. I think this is kind of a conservative approach. You don't want to run short on um, on funding through the year. Okay. Anybody else with any questions on uh, collection rate? Mike. Sure. Mike. I'm sorry. The screen that I have <clears throat> can't see everybody. There, you, there we go. Better. Tom. Uh, can I ask, where did we get the 98.65 number from? Why, why didn't we use 98.79? Tradition. Pardon me? Tradition. It was just a number that, Tom, that had been used um, for several years prior to fiscal 20. It was a number okay. that worked. And that was rooted in... Uh, you know, I don't know what we would see if we went further back in time. Right. But, uh, it was just a, a number in keeping with the general approach to uh, the way we budget revenues. OK. 
Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, next uh, table, Gary. Yep. Please. I'm just trying to get my little cursor. Right, so this is the analysis of salaries and wage increases by the uh, CBA collective bargaining agreements over the last uh, few years. And we also went through and picked out over the last uh, uh, 10 years, basically what the, uh, how many, how many of those bargaining units or groups took zeros as an increase. It looks like just one took a zero. No, they, they all, all bargaining units, well, we don't know custodians because they weren't under us. Oh so yeah. We didn't, we didn't have that, but every bargaining unit took at least one zero and uh, the non-affiliates slash admin group, which would be most of the department heads and I think two support staff, someone in IT and, um, and the executive um, secretary in, in this office took zeros for two, in two years. And so the thing that I always remind people is a hard zero basically means that you never recapture those funds. The individual doesn't recapture those funds because it's always a multiplier effect, right? You get a 2% one year, your salary is starting higher if you get 2% the following year. If you get a zero, you never recapture that loss. So we don't, we're in the middle of negotiations for physical services, 130340. We are starting negotiations oh, for, for 130340, also for 408, and then um, looking down the line, um, next year would be library for supervisors and non supes and then uh, 818 we're in the process of, and we don't have a contract for the non-affiliates admin group, um, a, a direct contract. It's not a collective bargaining agreement. Okay. So we're in right now for physical services and that will be in, and are all these, I mean, I'm looking at custodians and I guess we don't know prior years because they were under the board of ed, but I mean, just going back to typically three year, Contracts? Um, I can't say for certainty. I definitely can't for the custodians. The majority of ours are three year. This year we're doing a four year with the police department. Okay. Everything else is three. Gotcha. And I think I saw Stephanie on the call. Are these the numbers that we're looking for the out years as well? Similar going forward, going forward, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I don't want to tip my hat on negotiation strategies just in case people are chiming in, but we try to negotiate appropriately um, with, with the unions. Um, it's not just about the salary, there's other things that go into it, there's other benefits related, there's everything from time off, personal time health insurance, they can, um, I believe every union contributes a percentage to OPEB, which means they're taking care of the people going forward. So it's hard to say, just looking at the salary and wage increase, it's not, doesn't tell you the full story. You don't know what they lost on the other end. I will mm -hmm. say that Stephanie has done a great job at, um, at, at finding little savings for us. Some of those little savings are actually large savings. Um, along the way, which have multi-year impact going forward. Um, 
you know, long term, what you have to watch out for is there's a cost during these agreements. If we can't come to some agreement, um, and I'm going to do air quote off the record, it's not never really off the record, but it's a conversation with them. Um, then you end up in uh, mediation with the state or even arbitration with the state where someone else is making the decision. So there's nuances to this. Um, so it's hard for me to say, yep, we're going to press for, you know, one and a half percent, one and a half percent, two percent for the next three years, because until I get to the table with them and understand what they're looking for, um, it's, it's difficult to say. You know, um, I, and Sally's on the line too, but I know Sally and Stephanie were working uh, with physical services to try to get some of them to work um, uh, different shifts so that we could have some coverage during different hours, um, which would provide us some savings on overtime and ensure the parks are a little bit cleaner um, after there's been a lot of activity taking place in the parks. Um, you know, you gotta have to figure out what's the dollar amount on that one. Are we willing to give a eighth of a percent more and a pay raise to get what you want? Um, so there's a lot of give and take during these negotiations. Gotcha. Okay, anybody have any questions about historical trends for uh, raises? I, I have a, just a question about the physical services um, contract that expired last year um what's what happens with their raises since they're not their contract expired like a year ago what's i didn't like what are they budgeted for or do they still get a raise or not right now because you haven't come to an agreement with the new contract yep so for good budgeting purposes we do have a, a dollar amount that we put in the budget with an assumption um, we don't give, they get nothing until we come to an agreement. Um, they can negotiate for, uh, it, you know, we're at a stage where we're in, uh, we're in arbitration uh, and just waiting for a date because of COVID. Um, but it's not that unique for a town to be required to pay retro to July 1. Um, and it, occasionally you can get away with not having to pay retro depending upon the severity of, uh, of what took place during arbitration or, or even mediation. So the reality is that um, right now they're, they're fixed, they're flat, they didn't get an increase. Um, could they, could we have to go retro back to July 1 if things don't go in our way? Yeah, which is why we have to budget for it because you just don't know. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else? Okay, working down. Okay, yeah, we had asked you for similar to the other budget or the other um, department presentations in the binder. So, uh, salaries broken down. I think we we saw these at least the folks on our side saw these and discussed these last night. I mean. I think in your write up this afternoon, Gary, there was the question, we'll get to it, on the chief's raise. So um, I think that's where you know we wanted to get some information on that and a couple other things. I don't know if anybody had any questions on this table of uh, salaries for the police. Was this generally being reviewed because specifically for line, I don't know if it's line 805, but the chief's line 0004, or were there other things as well? I think it was, to be honest with you, I think we had asked a while back just because going through the budget presentations or department head presentations, all the others with the exception of physical services and the police did not have a um, breakdown of salary by staff. Right. And after your review, was, did you guys find anything that looked, uh, that you thought needed adjustment or that looked out of place? We just, we had a question or two on a couple of them. I think one was posed to Gary and he had 
written in the uh, email that came out this afternoon. We can go to that when we we talk about it. Um, other than that, I didn't see anything that kind of jumped out at me. I don't know about anybody else though. Anybody else? Thanks, Mike. I, I, oh, sorry. I I guess we'll get to it later because it was in the email. Is that what you wanted to do, Mike? The, about yeah. the okay. Unless unless you want to talk about it now. Well, I'm, you're, on, you're on topic if you wanted. To. Yeah. Well, just the uh, the chief of police. It looks like he's budgeted for a five point three percent raise. So we just thought that was higher than you know the other most anyone, um, and so. We just weren't sure what, you know, if he maybe didn't have a raise the last couple, you know, last year or whatever. Um, but because it just seemed high. Yeah. So it, and this is, um, this is one of those quirky things. So when the budget gets passed, um, things can adjust. Um, in this particular case, we didn't have a contract in place. So, um, what ends up happening is when the adjustment goes in. So when the budget passed in May or May 15th or 13th, whatever day we passed it last year in 2019, they didn't have a contract in place. So his salary was legally printed at 136,296. The budget, um, so the budget book will reflect that. Then come, uh, when did we settle? September or October, whenever we finish the police union, he gets his increase. So it goes up, whatever this increase was, I can't remember, two point something, 2.5, 2.75. And then this number that you're seeing for 143 reflects 136 plus that increase that took place in September, October. Now it's plus the, I think we just do a flat 2% estimate. Or actually his might be actual. I'm kind of looking at Mike, who's in my lower right-hand corner, but that's probably his actual because he's part of the contract. Well, it's it's the rate in the police contract. Right. So whatever year two of the police contract is, he's getting. So it does look like a significant jump. It's only because the budget number doesn't, the original budget number doesn't reflect what his actual salary was effectively. We don't, we don't include an increase in his salary if the employee's group is will be expiring going into the year being budgeted. So all those FY20 budgeted amounts you see in that column do not include any increase from FY19. Yeah, so this is from, from FY19, you know, so they would rec they would reflect what the employee was being paid at the time we did the budget last year. Not, gotcha. what we bud not what we budgeted at necessarily in 19, but it would reflect what the employee was being paid at the at time FY19. Together, with no increase because that group was in negotiations. Gotcha. So this is actually a two year from just the first line, 735. It's an actual two year increase of 87, 197 to 92, 034. That's right. Yep. FY19 and FY, let's see, realized FY19, FY20 is not in here. FY21 is 92.034. Correct. Got it. Okay. Good to know. That does clear up some issues and it's good to know that we can get the uh, the full amount. And I, I do remember, I think somebody had mentioned it, it was just simply, you know, that table would take up so much space on a page in the binder. So good. And then physical services. And again, we're looking at now it's a little bit different. FY20 budgeted. So is that the current salary this year and then what we have budgeted for next year? No, the amounts are the same because this group was going into negotiations last year right. and they remain in negotiations. 
So there may be some, a uh, couple of them, some changes, you know, from one year to the next for other reasons. Um, you know, a step typically, if an employee got a step, that would be reflected. But the neither columns reflect an increase for what we call GWI, which is the general wage increase, what you would think of as a raise. With the exception of, I think in this case, Director of Physical Services. Not part of the union. Which is non-union, right. And then any other position, I don't know any others that fit in there. In the director, 141 budgeted for FY21, budgeted and current salary of 135.7. Right, so that year. wouldn't. Right, that's, so that would. That's that's the budgeted salary, not necessarily the current salary. Correct. Just always bear that in mind. You're not looking necessarily at a current salary when you're looking at the fiscal twenty budgeted amount. Mike, would it be above or below the one thirty five seven? I don't know. It's probably exactly that, but it doesn't. You know, I just just a just a caution to everyone when they're looking at this information. I mean, I can find out what it is. I don't know. Off the top okay. Of it. I can tell you the 141 reflects Sally's current salary plus 2%. Right. That's how we budget. So we look at what she's being paid today and we add 2% to that. Yeah, because 141, 135.7. So it must be what the director was making before because it's actually about 4%. So. Right, so it was an increase. So it's not reflecting the increase that took place last year because it happened after the budget was gotcha. adopted. And then you have this one. Okay, so it's safe to say, Gary, you budgeted for all department heads and non-union a 2% across the board? I believe that, yeah. No. Not across the board. The chief gets what's in the police right. contract. Got it. Brooks' salary is, is not. determined by the board, um, so I don't town, know what we do this. I, th I don't think we included an increase this year. I'm not sure. Not for I don't think for Brook and then town clerk. And then town clerk is set by the council. Yep. Well, we budgeted town clerk at Dolores's current salary plus two percent. Got it. Four. Okay. And I think that was another question. So that clears that up. Anybody with any questions on these? Okay. And then this is the actuals or update. <clears throat> Yeah. Now you know why it was broken out, by the way. It's just, it's a long list. Right, right. No. In our, I guess, and I, I know Tom had some questions last Thursday, and a couple others had some questions about year to date spending. How, how are we looking? I mean, we could go through these numbers <laughs> each item at a time, but I don't want to do that. But, Mike, are you comfortable that there may be some realized savings in any of these due to, you know, the current situation or anything beyond, you know, what's going on right now? I expect we'll have unexpended balances. Um, we do a projection every two weeks after payroll. It's, it focuses not quite exclusively, but it, mostly on personnel costs, on payroll, salaries, overtime, et cetera. Um, but we have other things that we look at, utilities we look at closely um, and other things. So um, I'm confident we'll have uh, unexpended balances on the uh, on expenditures. But uh, you know what that is, I don't know. Um, you know, based on the request that came in this morning, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to be taking a close look at that over the next day or two and, and get you some information. Okay. Hey, Mike, what were the requests that came in this morning? 
the questions that are being answered here. I you know, think, yeah, Gary there. had sent out an email at about 530. This was from the memo just before we started the meeting? Yes. No yes. those questions? Okay, thanks. And this is a company, I guess, I, mean, I know I emailed a couple into Gary. I know a couple others emailed into Gary. I don't know if any of these others came from you, Matt, Amy, or, or Kevin. But I think after last Thursday and whatever meetings were held over the weekend, people just had additional questions for, for Gary and Mike to answer. Understood, thank you. Okay, so hopefully, Mike, we could get some, you know, a direction in the next couple of days on, uh, um, you know, what do you call it, unexpenditures? Just our expenditure projections. I'll do my best. We'll, we'll get you something tomorrow, you know, late tomorrow, and it'll be, uh, you know, understanding, uh, you know, timeliness is uh, important here for everyone. Yep, we appreciate it. Trust me, the longer we go on, the more I don't want to be dealing with budgets into midsummer. Both Kevin and I have worked at the legislature where we've gone summers without a budget. So it's no, it's no fun. Actually, being on the council as well, having no budget until October wasn't fun either. Okay, anybody had any questions about that? in particular i think that was the last of the slides you had for that for that grouping yep um i've got the fund balance one you want to do that one next sure Mike, I got to tell you, maybe you read it too, when I reviewed the fund balance, which came a little earlier, earlier than the other one. That sentence at the bottom of, it's not page 28, but it's label 28. They seem to conflict with each other, and I'm trying to resolve the conflict <laughs> mm -hmm. ba badly. <laughs> Mike, Mike O'Neill and I have kind of a little laugh at that one. Like It's but, so, yeah. So if you could help us out with that, that would be helpful. Right Shall here. I try? Someone has to because someone it seems like guidance is to eight to ten, but then best practices to sixteen point seven. Gary, can you can you pull back on that and so folks can see the the second hollow yeah. bullet at the top? Zoom out as well as, well as what you've highlighted. How far up? The the the, the and then scroll the to bullet the that's got two indents. The town shall propose budgets. Oh, up here. Oh, uh, this one? Right. Yes. So all this language is, comes from the, the policy, the adopted policy, which was included in the distribution. Um, the first highlighted area is uh, that 7 to 10 percent that, uh, that we always talk about. Um, and what it says is the town shall propose budgets that provide for an unrestricted general fund balance of not less than seven and not more than 10%, um, which, you know, seems to make sense until you uh, read the additional language in the second section that's highlighted um, that is in italics, which also comes from the policy which says as a general rule unrestricted fund balance in the general fund should represent no less than two months of operating revenues or operating expenditures uh, two months two over 12 equals 16.7 percent so the question is if that's uh, the the general rule that should be followed what does that first section mean I think it means that in the process of adopting a budget the council has, has agreed that it would not add to or take from fund balance such that it falls below 7% or pushes it above 
So I guess what that means is, so the only other way, well, really the only way fund balance is affected is when the lapses occur at the end of the year or when the deficits are applied at the end of the year, right? I mean, because that's reality is, is what we actually collect in revenue and what we actually spend. Um, and if it's, you know, if we spend less than we budget, that difference, if it is not transferred, you know, if it's not moved to other funds by virtue of, of the year-end transfers, it lapses to fund balance and it would increase fund balance. Um, same with revenues. If revenues are, are over budget, that variance lapses. That, that's something that, that nobody can touch, right? If, if the revenues are more than budget, it goes. That, in, that difference increases fund balance. If they're less than bu budget, it decreases fund balance. Right. Yep. So I guess what, um, so the only other, the only way to get to 16% would be through lapses. So it seems to suggest, I mean, it seems to say the, bud, the, the council can't get there by budgeting up to, you know, to get to 16%. You know, it has to rely on on lapses year over year lapses to get above to ten percent to get to sixteen point seven percent. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then, which I think is in you know, interestingly, I think it's in keeping with with the approach that I inherited. You know, when I came here uh, six years ago, um, which is a very conservative uh, approach to uh, particularly revenues, but, but expenditures as well, you know, with some exceptions. So then is that why if we look at the end of exhibit C, Moody's comparative fund balance that we see a Connecticut average of 16.4 and a New England average of 16.3. And that seems to certainly comport with the, you know, two over 12, which is, just a, it's a relative number. It doesn't even it's, have to do with dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting coincidence, you know, that it's, that that's, those are the median, um, those are the median percentages for, uh, for Connecticut and for New England, you know, for, for a number of communities. I don't know if they're strictly, you know, Moody's customers or if, if the population goes beyond that, but it's, you know, it's a presumably a, you know, a large enough of a, a pool of, um, of data, you know, that, that, that makes sense, you know, what they're showing as a median. It looks like then they take out the national, but for the reasons presented. So it seems like our guide of the two months does match the reality of other guides as well. Is that true? The reality, just the reality, period. Or just the reality. Yep. Okay. Now, in part of this here, it indicates that, you know, the reduction talks about Standard & Poor's rating methodology, but they didn't really get, you know, they said like, you know, we understand and blah, blah, blah. And then there's Moody's, which doesn't necessarily talk about that. They just talk about the number. So we're, I think I was looking for a little bit more guidance from you as it relates to you reached out to these individuals what happens when we start, if we start moving in the opposite direction of getting down to let's say 10%, if we're searching for a guidance of 16, how does that affect our ability to borrow? And I realize it looks like there's, there's, there's several criteria that they might use in addition to just fund balance, but yeah. you, you certainly have a good handle on the fund balance criteria where we're looking in other areas. Um, and our overall financial health. So if you take all the criteria that Moody's and Standard & Poor's uses, how will that affect our, I guess it's our bond rating specifically, but even our ability to borrow more generically? Well, I mean, certainly all things, all other things being equal, a reduction in fund balance, um, you know, is, would do nothing to help our credit rating. Now, obviously, you know, how much of a reduction, you know, would, would, you know, down to the, to the lower end of policy, you know, beyond that lower end, you know, 
I don't know. Again, I mean, you can see, I don't, you know, on, the only frame of reference I have for this is the standard and poor's, you know, what, what I have numbered as page 33, you know, is just an excerpt from their methodology. And you can see that the weighting is 10% of their total, you know, their total scoring system, you know, so it's not, it's something, you know, and it's, and again, you know, our score wouldn't change, you know, the, our, our score of two in that category would remain a two, presumably, um, if we went all the way down to 8%, you know, and, and, and again, and so I'm, I'm just reading off the page like anyone else can, you know, but I'm, I'm not sure I can do much better than that, you mm -hmm. know, in, in terms of, you know, it, it certainly, the rating agencies like to see fund balance. They, you know, they, they always like to see more. Um, and it looks like 15 is this next <clears throat> step, the magic number. And so, I mean, we have some guidance as a council then. If we're right. working our way up to 16 and point whatever, you can sort of see why it's that number because it's more than 15. And that's, right, uh, standard of poor's would, would give us a, a lower score, which is better for that. They, they score it like golf. How about the other 90% that sort of makes up our ability and our financial strength? How do you see so, that over the next couple of years? I'm sorry. I, well, just the last part of the question, Matt. <clears throat> Just how, how do you see that moving into the next fiscal year or two and you know where we're sort of coming from an approach to this particular budget so, so this is 10 percent but if the other 90 percent is also affected now we've got a cumulative effect sure. i'm wondering what you think of the other 90 percent so w w the other 90 percent is uh, is things like considerations like uh, socioeconomic factors in the region unemployment personal income household income uh, personal debt, household debt, that sort of thing, um, which we would expect would would see some deterioration in the next couple of years. Um, they consider uh, our existing debt, you know, and our 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 planned uh, debt, you know. So uh, nothing planned immediately, um, you know. So I wouldn't expect any change there. Um, you know, they look at management and. Goodness gracious, we need an exterminator in town hall. Um, I see that fly attacking me. <laughs> it's going to carry me away. Um, you know, the, the experience of management is something to, to a lesser extent. You know, it's probably less than 10%, but it is something they look at again. And they just look at, uh, you know, financial results and, you know, recent financial results and financial planning, you know, capital budgets, five year capital budget, that sort of thing. So I think in that in that sort of litany of things, there's some things that, you know, we would not expect to change, and there's other things that, you know, we would expect to deteriorate given given the moment, you know, that we're in. Thanks for your analysis, Mike. Mike, you may not know this, but in 2011, during the October snowstorm, I remember I was on council at the time. But I remember talking to folks that were, I think they used some part of the um, fund and help with the cleanup. Do you know of any of that? Do you aware of any of the use of the fund balance in the past? Mary, you kind of, the use of what? Use of fund balance for the storms in 11? I'm sorry, can you hear me? There we you, go. You, you yep. asked about, I believe I'm, uh, you asked about the use of fund balance in yeah. 2011 because of the storms? Yes. I'd have to look at that. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. It may, it may have been um, a substantial use of the contingency, but it certainly could have been, um, I can get that information. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, you know what the the actual was. I can find out. You know, in a in a in a moment here when you're not relying on. Okay. And and I'm assuming that that was probably the FEMA reimbursement to to replenish it is my mm -hmm. guess. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions on fund balance? 
just a comment. Sure, Tom. I think if we, you know, you can be selective about which part of the narrative you want to follow. And I don't see how we could be criticized for following our policy of seven to ten percent. The policy actually states that we're not supposed to go, we're not supposed to budget high, higher than ten percent, which I think has probably occurred. Mm -hmm. I would feel comfortable going to ten, which is the high side of our policy. It goes on to say that the fund balance is used to smooth out the variations in your budget also. Mm -hmm. And the only way we would drop to a one is if we were greater than 15. We'd improve. I mean, remember that the scoring as, as standard and pores uses uh, the lower, the better. Yep. So we would correct drop, but it would be that would be an uh, you know an up you know right contributing to it a uh, better score, a higher score, so a better score. Sorry. So we are comfortable to be anywhere between eight to fifteen. We would still maintain a two, and we are currently maintaining a two because we're at eleven. What are we? Eleven point five. That's right. Okay. So just don't go below eight, but obviously we don't want to, we don't want to use, well, I'm speaking for myself. I don't want to go much below what we have right now just because the unknowns for next year and the unknowns of any year. Okay. What else we got, Gary? Um, I think we're now into the more recent document. Um, I guess I missed one. Any second? No. All right. So I can bring up what I just shared. Actually, I have it in Word. That'd be easier. Everybody see that okay? Gone. That's, I'm good, but I also good. turned them off, so. Amy, you're usually the one who can't see it. <laughs> I pulled the document up on my uh, desktop, so I can see it at my own, um, <laughs> my own font size, thank you. Gotcha. So, um, first question is regarding the uh, collection and the impact on, or the collect, basically how MDC calculates a sewer charge um, per the budget, the MDC adopted budget document. Um, they use the actual collected revenue based on a three year average. So in December, they gave us, December or January, they passed it in December, they probably gave it to us in January based on their adopted budget. They gave us the amount. Mike O'Neill includes the exact amount in our proposed budget document. Well, it has absolutely nothing to do with usage. Is that correct? What's the? The charge is being based on a revenue collection rate, not on what we're actually utilizing. Isn't that correct? Not the rate, but the collected dollars. The beauty of ad valorem. 
Yeah. I don't think it's changed Dan so much. No, it hasn't. I mean, it's a, nope. I, think, I just I don't, I don't quite understand why we do it that way. I mean, we should be paying for what we use. Period. And there is a uh, there has been uh, some pushback from the member towns uh, to try to get them to evaluate it different ways. I'll get you a copy of the study. They hired a an outside agency to do an analysis. They came up with don't quote me five or seven different ways to fund it. Um, and uh, trying to figure out which one is the, the best one or the, the least um, impactful to residents. Um, each community kind of had their own opinion, opinion on it. We narrowed it down to about three, and then we asked them to go back and kind of complete the study um, to do a little bit more of a, a deeper dig, and then COVID hit. So we're all kind of in a frozen status at this point. But I'll get you a copy of the most recent Reftilis study. Thank you. Okay. MBC, anybody else with any questions at MBC? And basically, this is what it is, right, Gary? I mean, you hand us a bill. Yep. Okay. Unfortunately. And it seems historically six and six point four, ten percent increase back in eighteen, nineteen, six point nine, six point four. So historically we're on track. And they do adjustments in there, right? So they'll they'll reduce some interest rate, but then increase their customer charge, you know. For their call center by a dollar, so they they try to make it not as burdensome, but it's you know they're just really moving line items. Okay. Good. Next question on firefighter the uh, tax abatement program. Yep. Um, so uh, and just to kind of clarify on the sentence. So the um, we use revenues to let's adjust for 1.5 million, right? So to determine the um, the calculation is based off of value of property, which is a 1.5 million. Um, the individual who calculated this came in at about 63,000. I think we were around 61, but uh, over the 2,000, um, I don't think it matters. Uh, I think that's just the way we did it. I also see a line item in the binder, right? So when you compare the two, it, what it comes down to is that firefighters have an option, have three options of how they receive their benefits. Um, what we do is budget based off of the number of available fire eligible firefighters, which we don't know from one year to the next, depends upon how many calls they respond to, whether or not people join, whether or not people um, fall out of fire service. We don't know how many fires you're gonna have in a year. Um, and so we provide that credit adjustment within the grand list. Uh, the information that we based it off of, we confirmed that there were 45 eligible members at $1,000 a piece, it's $45,000. Uh, Mike's crew is taking a look to see if, um, if there's any ability to make adjustments based off of an average um, uh, over the past, just to see if maybe there's some room within there to mm -hmm. make adjustments. The problem with fires and emergencies, you just don't know from one year to the next. So we could take a look at the average. We could be right, we could be under, we could be over. Okay. So the abatement, and Tom, you may wanna speak of this because this was your question and I noticed it too. There was 45,000 in one, line, but then 30,000 in the fire suppression binder book. Yeah, I, I think if I'm understanding correctly, they're not sure wh which way the firefighters are going to ask for the benefit. So it's put in both places. Is that true? Not a not hundred percent. I mean, so I think you know, we have 45 members who are entitled to the $1,000 benefit. So we have uh, $45,000 worth of benefit 
uh, that we need to budget for. Um, we have combined, if you take the 63,000 that was calculated plus the 30,000, we have 93,000 budgeted. You know, I think we could, you know, we could squeeze both of those down a little bit, you know, to account. We can look at the history and see how that split is. I think the split is a little heavier on, if I recall, on the on the tax credit side, you know, which would be the the uh, the grand list adjustment versus the the you know taking it by check. Um, so, you know, we can look at that and see if there's a, a pattern there, you know, and if we can rely on some history to, you know, to make a reasonable estimate of how the forty five thousand would be split. You know, let me just, I'll just make up numbers. And, and as an example, if it was, you know, we decided, you know, we thought we were going to pay 15,000 by check and the 30,000, you know, through a, a applied to the tax bill, you know, maybe we, maybe we budget 20, 25,000 in the department and, and then, you know, add a little bit to the 30,000, maybe maybe 40,000, 45,000 on the other side to just account for, you know, any uncertainty there. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say you look at that and you take the 63 plus the 30 is 93. We know the total benefits 45. There, there's room to, you know, to, to pull those outer limits in. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't trying to make a science project out of it. I just saw it in two places and didn't realize that, it was their option to take it in cash or uh, right. property tax right. credit. Right. Yep. Got it. Okay. So maybe if we can tighten up those two figures a little bit, Mike, get us, yep. you know, where we historically have been, that would be good. Get a little clarity on it. Mayor, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, if you're looking back at like the last three to five years, uh, is 45 the, uh, you know, I know that's how many firefighters we have currently. Is that about average? Are we low? Are we high? How does that fit into it as well? Because that would impact some of the numbers. So we know, we know the 45 is a good number because we get that from, you know, that we have other, there's other things on the pension, you know, related to the allocations that we have to do and the pension year ends on March 31st. So we get the, we get that good year information from the fire department at the end of April. So we, we know now that, that this $1,000 benefit is gonna to apply to 45 members. Okay, good, thank you. And it's, and it's, it's a declining number. I know that they've, they've had fewer members who are uh, you know, earning a good year. Right. Yeah, so just to clarify, there's, there's more for firefighters than 45. 45 is the number that have been able to respond to the proper number of fires and do all right. the things that they require that. ability. So I, I think the total firefighters are up around 100 or 105 or something like that. Very good. Thank you, Tom and Mary, or uh, Amy, sorry. Um, Okay, going forward, also under fire suppression, hydrant, this is NBC's money. Yeah, this one kind of came out of the blue for both Mike and I last year, uh, and we had provided it to the council. Uh, they made a, a, an adjustment in their billing cycle. So rather than billing in, a, in arrears, they basically do a forward look. So what we had to do last year, if you were, well, it's only a handful of you on here. Um, but what we had to do is go back to council um, and make the adjustment in the fire suppression line item because we were over uh, as a result of the adjustment. So we had to use, um, at the end of the year, we had to do a, a budget appropriation. Why can't I think of what it's called? But we had to move from one line item to another to uh, handle the, uh, the end of year transfer. So this new amount reflects the normal billing cycle, um, we believe it's a good number. Um, and then the second component of that is that um, we haven't paid the bill yet for this fiscal year. We're anticipating it uh, coming in. We did reach out to Rich just to see if it had come in yet. Um, sorry, Chief Bailey, uh, and he was gonna check back, but we haven't received it yet. So those funds that are in there now are still 
for lack of a better term, encumbered to pay that bill. Okay. And we're comfortable with that number being where it is and next year's going up? Yeah, I mean, I don't like it, but, but yeah, it's our, uh, it's the anticipated number. MDC is pretty reliable that way. Yeah. yeah. Until they change the budgeting on you, then that comes out of the blue. Okay. Did anybody have any question on the uh, uh, hydrants? Okay. Physical services, old academy, and Keeney for the chimney. Yeah, so that was um, the chimney component should have been moved out. That was taken care of. Um, what we do in physical services, and if you look in all the budgets, um, there's usually a line item related to maintenance. There isn't one in town hall and physical services uh, or specifically broken out for physical services. So it all gets lumped in uh, town hall, physical services, old academy, Keeney, Little Road Schoolhouse are two separate line items within physical services uh, or there's sub line items within the org. Um, $25,000 is the estimate for maintenance within those three buildings. Um, and then town hall is at 12. All right, so we typically budget 25,000 for maintenance work that typically gets done throughout a number of buildings that the town has. Yep. Yeah. Does this include the cupola at all at Old Academy or is that completely separate? I believe that, yeah, that's separate. That's gonna be, uh, that's going to be a much larger number if we do the cupola. Uh, that's a copper top. That's in the, uh, that's in the capital. Uh, yeah, as part of the roof. Roof repairs. But it's not in this year's. They didn't vote on it this year. No. No. No, no it's a, uh, I believe that's a slate roof too, Tom. I can't, Deputy Mayor, that, I'm trying to picture it, but that would, that's a more expensive proposition than 25000 Um. Maybe we can apply it. Basically, it was just the text was inaccurate, right? So, yeah, yeah, the text is inaccurate. Not true. This is regular maintenance. Okay. Same thing with number five. If are we ready to move on to the next one, sir? Sure. I think so. Anybody have any questions about the twenty-four and twelve? Okay. Similar in number five. That was a typo. We're missing a number. Um, I can assure you that we're not buying $26,000 worth of um, protective gear, shoes, and other equipment for four employees. It's, it's about 45, and depending upon the union contract and what they're allowed for and the type of work that they're, the, the work function, the type of safety gear they need, they receive between $500 to $600 um, in a, uh, every year. So this has a, um, cushion because there's sometimes turnover in positions, um, but there's uniforms, um, steel-toed boots, vests, and other related equipment. Gotcha. Non-slip shoes. Anybody have any questions on that? Just simply Did, type off. Do they get the uh, five to six hundred dollars cash or is it depending on what they actually buy? Um, can I, I can answer that question for you, uh, Deputy Mayor. They do not get cash. They are given a voucher and, and we have gone around, there are two stores that they can use that voucher at and they cannot exceed the voucher. Uh, anything that they exceed, they pay for. Anything that they come under, they do not get the Delta in cash. Okay. Thank you. Good to know. GPS, Sally, you're still on. GPS for trucks? Yes, I'm here. Um, 
I don't know if you have the question in front of you, but there was 12,000 in this year and last year's budget yes. for GPS on trucks. Um, what are they used for? And we, we utilize the GPS um, in a functional way, not, I want to tell people, not in a big brother way. Um, we track for safety. There are spots in town where cell phone and radio is deficient at times and one of the ways that we can find out where our crews are are by locating the vehicle this is especially true for things like tree work where you have both people out of the truck uh, performing the work high uh, road crews things like that um, we do also use it for tracking the rate of speed that trucks go at um, we do also, it allows us to look as efficiencies as to when, for example, a mowing route, what, how long it took a, a vehicle to go from point to point to point. This is, um, this is valuable information for us. It has, there have been times when we have questioned um, some people's whereabouts and we were able to definit definitively see where they are. Um, and thankfully, those are few times that we've had to use it, but when we have, we've had it. Um, we do especially use it for, as I said, the safety, the vehicle use, how long a vehicle is idling um, or, you know, in one particular place. Okay. Can I, can I just ask, Mike, can I ask a question? Sure. Hey, so is this some hard box that's put in every single truck to track it and if it is are we buying one every year to replace them or like i would think if it's a box you just pay a gps fee is that twelve thousand an annual fee or is that hardware or how does it it's a combination of both there isn't a hard box there is wiring in the trucks um which feeds the information to the um, we'll call it the satellites yeah. um which then you know we get the information and we can track it in real time we also have uh, now with this twelve thousand. this also includes putting the gps in some of the vehicles that we receive from the board of ed so that we can understand the patterns of the trades workers so do we have a an annual fee for that it, it's encompassed in this twelve thousand dollars yeah no i'm just curious what is that fee though i will have get, to yeah we can get you the breakout yeah. we can get your breakout of cost i'll get you that sorry Anybody else any questions on that? Yeah, that was actually what I was going to ask Dan as well. Thank you. How many how many vehicles did we inherit from the Board of Ed? We inherited uh, seven, eight, seven vehicles. Um, each of the trades person people have a van that are pretty old. Um, we also inherited the box truck and a truck with a lift. And a mail carrier. No, um, well, there, that vehicle we do charge the Board of Ed for maintenance on. Got it, okay. Thank you. We did, uh, oh no, number seven. Yep. Sidewalk, lawn, and snow repair. That was a small amount, but it was still 3,000. Yep, that, that's a combination. That's kind of tied to our blight enforcement level of things. Um, occasionally, more often than I'd like, um, when property owners do not um, maintain their property, whether it's commercial or residential, um, we will go and address the issue and then we'll lien their property for the dollar amount. Those, we have to pay the contractor um, for that work. 
typically we recapture that through the lien if they sell or transfer otherwise transfer their property. Unfortunately, you just don't know when they're going to sell or try to transfer their property or refinance. So um, funds have to come from somewhere. We your market separate so we can track it. Yeah. And then do we typically pay 3000 a year or do we recoup it from liens? Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I can say $3,000 doesn't go very far when it comes to addressing blighted properties. Right. Um, you know, you're looking at one property with addressing it for lawn mowing could be four to $600, depending upon the condition, whether or not you're hauling stuff out of the back. If you have to board out a property after a fire, uh, you know, it could be years before the insurance company pays you back. Um, so I, I can do some research just to see what maybe our average has been or where we paid from it before there was a line item. Um, you know, we do have quite a few properties that when they sell, we do get paid back. Uh, but again, it's hard to anticipate when that happens. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. At three thousand dollars, you know, I, I don't, I don't think you have to go. We've got other issues we're working on, so you don't have to go digging back through historical data on that. Hey, Mike, let me just ask one quick question, if you don't mind. The mm -hmm. I thought we used to fine them. Did they yeah. stop that practice, or is that so they get fined and a lien? Yep. So our blight, uh, we. Um, we tightened up some of the language of the blight ordinance in November or December of this past year. Uh, the fine still exists, so it's $100 per day per violation. Um, over a period of time, if they don't address it, then rather than allow it to sit out there and languish with fines, we'll go and clean up the property and then we'll add, we'll lien their property. Um, and that will include obviously repayment of the fine as well. Okay. So if they don't pay us one way or another, we're going to try to get paid. Um, ultimately, some of these you negotiate out, um, depending upon what the scenario is with the property, right? So we're not going to, yeah. it's a foreclosed property um, that owes us money. And I've got a buyer on the line who's got ready to move forward on it. I want to be careful not to, not to kill the deal, but I still want to get, I still want to get paid on it. Right. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes, we still do fine. I think eight and nine have been answered already. Um, it was not what was reflected in the budget, but what was existing in FY19, budgeted 20, and then proposed for 21. So I'm good with eight and nine. Anybody had any other follow-up questions on those? Okay, getting to 10, one of the bigger ones. The, um, well, this is the smaller of the two questions about the uh, pools, but uh, the high school pool, does yep. that continue to operate throughout the um, summer? Uh, so the high school pool is um, typically in non-COVID years, it is rented out by the School of Swimming. It actually generates revenue for us. Um, and then usually in late summer, you have the uh, high school women's swim team begins practicing because they're fall sport. They're a fall sport. And then as well as uh, swimming classes um, that begin. Uh, and then, and I do mention here that it's open during the winter. We have a combination of public use, swim lessons, school use, um, and so it's it's difficult to shut it down simply because it is within the school. It does have school usage. Um, and so you can't, because it's a big open area of water, you can't just leave it unattended um, or unmaintained. We also... Um, You're still here? Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, Sally. I'm still here. Sorry. Um, as far as the pool, the pool is also used as a training facility for the park and rec staff. Mm -hmm. And um, as Gary had mentioned, we do need to keep water in the pool, the filters going, and the systems going in order to maintain the pool. Um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, not having water in the pool is not a good thing. 
um, because it also is used during the academic year. So we need to make sure that it is operating properly throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're good. I will add that right now we are, we have decreased the temperatures of the pool um, in order to get some cost savings. Um, and we can adjust it if, you know, moving forward. But for now, um, we have, we're trying to do some energy savings at the high school. And that's one yep. of the things. Good. I know somebody sent me a photo of the uh, lights above the pool. They're all back working and functioning. Yes, they are. We were able to get in touch with the manufacturer. Um, apparently the high school was one of the first places that these lights were used. <laughs> so we were the test test yep. uh, location apparently. Pretty much, but okay. it, we're now very, uh, we have a, a, we've learned a lot about them. Yes, yep, as have I. Okay, um, number 11, this is uh, the bigger one and this is kind of like the unknown right now and I, I think we're all kind of waiting to see what either the state does or what the health district does. Um, pools or towns are tending to close pools. I, I believe I heard Manchester close today or we'll be planning to close their pools. East Hartford, I thought, maybe as well, I heard. Um, do we know where we are on what we plan to do with either Willard or Mill Woods? We're working on contingency plans for both. We are waiting to see uh, from the state what their guidance is. Um, places, pools are a little bit, more difficult than like a mill woods, uh, the general structure and setup of it. Um, so it's it's tough when I look at other communities, like we're having this conversation with Rocky Hill, they're still undecided, but we're, we're probably on the same page. Um, we're just kind of hoping the state comes back with some better guidance on total amount of number of people allowed, what's acceptable for social distancing. Um, Willard would probably be tough, mill woods, has a um, has a different setup. Um, it's really not so much the pool, um, but it's a combination of the pool area and then the bathing facilities. So bathrooms, um, you know, whether or not we're able to clean and maintain the bathroom to a suitable level. Um, you know, we we Parks and Rec has worked out a contingency plan that looks at everything from uh, a lot increasing their operating hours so more people can come in throughout the day, but then sectioning off how many people will be allowed in at any given time. The idea that maybe they could come for an hour or two, they could turn over, staff could take 20 minutes to clean uh, bathroom areas and then let the next group in. So they've, they've kind of run possible contingency scenarios um, to make it available. And then we're kind of just waiting to see if the state comes back um, or department of, the current Department of Public Health guidance is um, gives you a number, but it's a question of whether or not we can work with that number. Mayor, may I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, so Gary or Sally, some of these numbers here, we have pool water, 26,000, uh, pool chemicals and pool electricity. Uh, of the, I, I'm assuming that that's, um, half a year so that we're still able to open the pools next year. And then my other question is, um, have the pools not already been filled? And if, and can we leave them without chemicals and without filters running for a season? Um, will there be, you know, mosquito issues? Will there be structural issues uh, without filling them or putting chemicals and electricity in if they've already been filled? So I'll, I'll start with the first part. Sally, you can chime in as we go. Okay. Um, the, the dollar amount that's provided here uh, allows for opening next year. Um, it's not a half, it's a, it's a smaller percentage, but for both Parks and Rec and Physical Services, there's money in the budget um, 
that would allow for us to, to open up and move forward next year. Okay, good, um, thank you. The, so the dollar amount, I mean, they may not be exact. Um, I'm just looking at it quickly online, but should cover, um, should would be the cost to operate this year. There has been work done. Uh, physical services took advantage of the warmer weather in early spring, which was early March, end of February, early March, when COVID hit um, full force and we had to shut things down where they began prepping. Um, uh, everything from fields to the pool area. There has been some work. There are requirements to maintain it at a certain level so we don't ruin the infrastructure there. Um, and so those costs, I want to say, were between eight to ten thousand. Um, yes. Plus or minus. Okay. Yes. Memory isn't as bad as I thought. Nope. Um, of cost already incurred. What we haven't incurred are the training for lifeguards, for or uh, f additional physical services staff to maintain the area. We are the pools are filled and are being treated based on um, having a inspection date next week from the Department of Health. Not next week, uh, June 3rd, I believe it is. So we've, we've filled the pools in this year's budget for the summer. So the pool water, 26,000, where does that come in? That that's not filling the pools next year. We're adding, no. We add more water throughout the year. Correct. So this is for two pools. I don't know what percentage it's been it's been filled, but I think you know we we have to get chemicals and we have to get it up to reach. Yeah, the, we're not at a hundred percent, but we're at enough so that we can move water around. We can move the right amount of water according to the Department of Health. We can put in the first round of chemicals, make sure that we have that set. And then throughout the summer due to evaporation, we also have to add water. At two, at the two facilities. Yes. Thank you. Just, just to clarify, if I could. We keep talking about pools, plural. We're, we're talking about Willard and Millwoods Pond, is that correct? Yes. And the high school pool is already running, just at a lower temperature. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, and you're confident that uh, the health district will be sending out an inspector next week. We have we have an inspection date. Charles Brown, the director of the Central Connecticut Health District, is aware that we've made the date with one of his inspectors, and so we are planning on having it. If something, as you all know, with this COVID situation, things change day to day. If that gets pulled from the Department of Health, then we would have to deal with that. But at this point, we do have it scheduled. Gotcha. And that we have it scheduled based on the schedule that Park and Rec needed in order to get their people um, trained and acclimated to the working conditions at the pools and then open for a season, whatever time that may be. And the pools, the outdoor pools are cold <laughs> right now. They need, that water needs time to warm up. Mm hmm Okay, anybody else with any questions about Willard or Mill Woods? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, have we received any guidance from CCHD up to this point? I mean, just on their general recommendations, you know, obviously COVID is um, easily spread. Uh, you know, have they, have they talked to us at all about what their recommendations would be even without the inspection? 
we talk to CCHD on a regular basis. I have a weekly meeting with them about operations. Um, there's many things that they don't like in general. Uh, that's kind of their job is to tell us what their concerns are. Uh, we measure that with Department of Public Health, C CDC guidance and state other state guidance. Um, Charles is very upfront and with the things that he likes and the things that he doesn't like. And he keeps saying it's about safety, safety, safety. Um, I don't know if I have an official memo from him about whether or not we should open. My suspicion is that uh, from conversations, he'd prefer nothing be open right now, uh, including reopening any part of the economy uh, until further notice, which I completely understand. Um, and he has a job to uh, protect the health and safety as well. Um, so we're, we're always in conversations with him. We bring this up every Thursday. We tell him our fears and our concerns. Um, he shares them um, and we try to work through ways that we can make it work, which is why Kathy is jumping through a lot of hoops just to see if she can feel comfortable with the idea, um, if there's enough ability for us to provide safety. Reasonably, there may not be. Um, and that's a reality that this council has to face. And, and as a town manager, I think about on a regular basis. So um, it's, uh, you know, that part of the reason we're waiting on the guidance from the state and Department of Public Health is to determine whether or not we can meet that guidance. Um, just to kind of, and I think it comes later in the, the discussion, but it's the whole idea of summer camps. You know, we've realized that we can't meet the guidance and we don't feel comfortable with it. So we pulled the plug on it. Um, at the same time, we have the, uh, I shouldn't say, but we have another camp that's non-town related that wants to use one of our buildings and the state has given it the green, you know, the thumbs up to do it. Um, and, you know, we have to have a real hard conversation about whether or not we should even be allowing that um, as a discussion. We don't feel it's safe to run a camp or that we can meet the guidance. If the state comes down with the guidance, I would make a recommendation to the council or the council has to make a decision. Um, if they feel comfortable. And one other question on the same note, do we open ourselves up to any liability issues if by some chance we reopen the pools and then someone were to catch the virus? The fact is, unfortunately, the town becomes the target for every liability, potential liability out there. Um, I would argue that it's similar to working on any playground or park um, or entering any uh, town building. There's some level of liability we may have um, or going to any kind of sporting event as well. Um, those are all great questions that I can run by Corp Council and see if they can give me an opinion on. Um, but again, ultimately, we may get guidance that we realize and I'm coming right back to you guys saying no way we can meet it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good question. I will uh, look into. So if we decide not to open the pools, do we then drain the pool or because wouldn't it be a liability to have a, a body of water that's, in, you know, when there's kids around and it's hot and it's summertime? Yes. Not allowed. I heard yeah. Sally chime in with, I was going to say, I'm not allowed. I shouldn't be playing attorney on either one of your questions. Um, there's probably some safety there's from a legal standpoint we put up a fence to keep people out however at the same time people do hop it I don't know from and Sally you might be able to answer this from a maintenance standpoint how low we can drain it before it's an issue I don't have the exact amount but I know that to answer that in the reverse we haven't filled it all the way so all things I can look into. But we would make it safe just as we do at the end of a normal season. Sure. Okay. I just, can I ask a quick question, Mike? Sure. I, um, I was gonna ask about, I, and I know this, I ask, I feel like I ask this every meeting. Do you know when the guidance will be coming out from the state. I don't know if the governor has indicated, um, you know, or if you are anticipating the guidance on the pools uh, by a certain date, because you know, we're already after Memorial Day and it seems like 
this is, you know, we should have this information. Uh, so have you heard anything about, or do you have a date by which you uh, expect that information? It, it's, it's a great question, actually, Counselor. Uh, it seems to be a moving target every time we think we nailed it down. The last I heard was May 28th. I'm actually going to try to look quickly. Uh, 27th or 28th, um, which is tomorrow or Thursday. But um, like I said, it seems to be a moving target. It, you know, it's similar to the um, opening up hair uh, dressers and our barber shops. The day before you thought they were going to open, uh, and here I am still with these. So, um, you know, I'll, I apologize that I don't know that off the top of my head. I'll reach out to Kathy and see if I can get a better date for you. But we were all under the impression that this upcoming week we would have guidance, additional guidance. Um, even speaking with Rocky Hill last week, we're all like, okay, we, we believe we'll have it next week. So um, let's wait until next week. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I will press that issue the best I can. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else? Okay. So on a holding pattern for that, um, go to the Keeney for utilities. Looks like those three, Old Academy, the Schoolhouse, and um, Keeney are at 64,000. Has that gone up? Is that typical? Uh, look at last year's. I think that's typical. I mean, it, it's it is. Go ahead. It is typical. Um, the Keeney is an expensive building to run in that all of their heat is electric. So we're running at pretty significant bills throughout the entire year, whether it's air conditioning or heat. Hmm. Where some other buildings, you know, our heat is natural gas, and we see some um, some savings there. Is the Keeney Center closed to the public right now? Yes. Yes. No rentals. No, probably just historical society staff. I imagine that there is very few people in there. Um, just making sure that there's, you know, they're walking the building and making sure that the collection is safe. Okay. So maybe not just like the high school pool, if we could set the air conditioner to. Yes, we've um, asked that we make sure that we're not chilling the building for no one. Um, you know, down to below. The average temperature is 68 to 72. We want to set it in the 70s to where we wouldn't cause damage to any, uh, to the building or to any of the collection, but still not keep it at the same level as if you were having people or functions, um, anything like that. Good. Anybody else? That's fine. Okay. Summer camps, we know as of last Friday, maybe. You sent it out, Gary. We are canceling. Yeah. So. yeah, it was kind of a, you know, and just talking to Kathy and concerns about being able to meet the objective and guidance, It, it's not financially feasible, nor is it in the best interest of health and safety um, to try to accommodate, I think it's, you know, 10 people per section. Um, no more than 30 unless you get a waiver. 30. We, we would have to be outside cleaning equipment, um, like playground equipment, playscapes, as well as cleaning the bathrooms. It just becomes, unfortunately, too difficult to manage. Okay. But we won't realize any savings with the closure of uh, youth camps, Parks and Rec youth camps? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some, uh, but they do generate revenue for the, uh, for the town, so there's an offset. Um, 
but there, the two that I included here were for therapeutic recreation um, and about $5,000 for the playground program. We would have to um, eliminate those programs. Gary, are they still running the teen theater this year? I don't know. I think those are all shut down right now. They're, those are all, yeah, no, those are out. Um, okay. Kathy is working Gary. on, Kathy is working on online, potential online programming to continue some of the online programming that's currently going on. Um, but I think, I think teen theater was one that was done because all the buildings, at least at this point, are closed. Yes. Um, I'd have to check. Okay. Anybody, any comments or questions about youth camps and parks and rec? Is, is there any other staff that we will not hire, part-time staff? Yeah, I threw in there, there's about 8,000, 8,500. So, Seasonal staffing um, won't be hired, so we won't put them in there. And then there's typically another 8,500 in office help um, that we use during the summertime as a result of the increased volume of work, as well as the fact that the normal staff is on, uh, takes vacations. Um, so I added that in there. So the, eight, the 8,429 will go away, is that what you're saying? Correct. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Everybody good on that one? We've got uh, merit increases in the town manager's office. Yep. Uh, so this I don't know how long ago this started, but this is, uh, there's, I'm trying to calculate the number in my head. I believe six non-union department heads and then two support staff, um, one in IT um, and then one in this office that um, those are performance incentives um, currently budgeted within the reserves for retirees because it's a, it's a number that's not known at this time. I know a couple folks had some questions about that, just looking in the, and when it was presented to us at the workshop, there were some questions. Um, yeah, I had a couple questions. I, I know we discussed this at the workshop, um, at least not the IT person, but the other two, the HR manager and the executive secretary. These are the, is that two of the people were? They that? would they'd be included in that group, yes. Okay, just, I mean, I was thinking because they had substantial raises, 11 and, no, I'm sorry, maybe 10% or so in the last year that, you know, an additional 2% on top of that just seems an awful lot during this time when you know, there's so many layoffs and pay cuts around us and other sectors. Um, and like, a, you know, like I said at the workshop, not that they're wonderful, but they just got maybe about a 10% increase in pay within the past calendar year. So I think it would be fair to forego an extra 2% at this time, but that's just my opinion. Yep, so if I can address that, uh, uh, thank you for making that point. The, there's no guarantee that, so there's no guarantee that anyone in the group gets 2% or 2.5% or even 1.5%. It's a performance incentive. Um, those adjustments for those two positions, uh, in my opinion, were not only, and I, I, I understand what you're saying, um, it's more than just those two positions uh, in there. There's about eight. Um, so. Those would kind of be, I guess my thing is that's more of a, a case by case, but I believe those two positions were being right sized uh, for, for skill set, for what the requirements of the job are. Um, but, uh, you know, point taken, the, the dollar amount, the full dollar amount is based off of 
a performance incentive for the group, not just those two. And there's certainly no guarantee of a 2%. When is well, that? I'm sorry, Mary, go right ahead. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, so when is, is that something that you would, you would determine, uh, Gary, like, uh, you know, is there a certain time, you like at the end of the fiscal year or something? Is that when these things, decisions get made? Yeah, so, um, and so I came on at, um, is, yes, there's usually a time, an evaluation period where we do a review. Um, I'm not sure when Jeff typically did the review. I came in mid-year in 2019. Um, and so I couldn't really review them in that first six months. I think typically it would have been like a July one. Uh, so I had pushed it off. Um, I, I want to say, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say December was typically the time Jeff did it, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it usually is a July to coincide with a July one, uh, fiscal. So it would be retro. Oh, okay. So typically I would do the evaluation year end. Here's where you're going to be. It would be effective July. one. Okay. And you said this was for six others as well. For the most part. I think we're six. Hold on. Yeah. Well, it's eight total. Um, if I believe. All right, so it's non-union department heads and then two, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, you're eight total. Six, six non-union department heads and then someone in IT and then the executive secretary. Okay. Anybody else have any questions on those positions? Okay. So now looking at certification, this is one of the questions that I kept coming up on both Board of Ed and with ourselves. Uh, any things we would be able to uh, um, realize with training and certifications most likely canceled where facilities can't host them or anything like that so it looks like savings of about twenty thousand dollars is this just for the town or is this town and board of ed combined? this is just town side just town okay and it, um yeah it's just town I wanted to make sure I had the library in there. In Got it. Okay. Well, anybody with questions on training savings? Good. Townline Radio. I know uh, Mary had some questions on this as well last time we spoke on Thursday because John did say there were some places he could think of some savings so yep um, so just kind of the evaluation of what he would have to give up um, and he felt that he could get away with uh, I think the original line item was around 30,000 or 30,200 with with both items in there the HVAC and the radios um, the recommendation is to make sure we have some kind of replacement schedule in mind simply because these are these it's for emergency response emergency equipment we don't want to be cut without um having some way to um to cover a cost in any given year so the recommendation was about eight thousand to put about eight thousand dollars aside so at any given moment we had at least something to start from Hey Gary, mm -hmm. that number was actually those two items combined were twenty-two five. 
So taking them down to 8,000 would, would reduce it by 14,500. I apologize for that. I looked at this and didn't catch that. And fixed. And so this is just assuming, you know, John's recommendation was um, to put the money aside, you know, to do upgrades. You know, one of the items was upgrades of the, the HVAC system. We have four, top, four shelters. Um, so eliminating that just means, you know, eventually those, you know, could fail. And, you know, we would just, you know, the 8,000, the idea behind the 8,000 is, you know, if the HVAC fell somewhere or if, uh, you know, we get down to where we have a critical need for replacement radios, you know, we've got something to start from to fund that, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, we're not creating a problem somewhere else, you know, to solve something that, uh, you know, we weren't able to plan for. Okay, I have one more question about the townwide radio. I had looked back at my notes during the budget workshop and um, John mentioned that for the executive square lease, when he was going over, you know, sort of line by line, he said, oh, it's, it's listed as going up $2,100. That's wrong. It should only be going up $360. So that line item, um, I'm, you guys probably don't have this right in front of you. I happen to it include, have. It includes electricity. It's not, so, it's not a lease payment. So the, so the line item that says executive square lease that is includes more than the executive square lease. That's because he, he, he stated that it was, it should have been like 12, 360, but you added in electric or electricity. Is that what you're saying? That's, the line includes electricity. It's, it's, I believe it's on the same invoice with the lease payment. It may be a separate invoice, but it's from the, it's from the same management company. You know, so it just, okay. it's, all, it's all paid to the same vendor and that's why it's all budgeted on the same line. We can, we'll improve the description to include electricity for next year. Oh, well, I only brought it because he said it, but he might've been th just thinking of the actual lease and not the separate Thing that was combined okay that's fine i just wanted to make sure it wasn't you know we weren't budgeting for something that was not necessary we're not so mike you're looking at roughly a 1700 dollar increase in electricity for executive square whatever the uh yeah 2100 covers the, the increase in the, in the lease and whatever the estimate was for electricity. Okay, wow. It's going up. Um, okay. Thank you. Want another mic on the radio? Yep. Power. Um, I thought my notes indicated that uh, he had requested 10,000 for miscellaneous spare parts and thought he had some flexibility there. Do you have any uh, comments on that, Mike? I believe you. If, if John said it and you heard him say it, I don't recall it, but it's certainly, we'll look at that and knock that down a little bit, Tom. Yeah. It was, I'll it was very late. Him evening and everybody was ready to leave and <laughs> it was like he wanted to explain in detail all, all the nope. scenarios and <laughs> I think we said we're good for now. <laughs> I I had uh we'll circle back with him. I did reach out with him reach out to him. He had mentioned to um there was ten thousand for the two mobile radios. Um or, well not to eliminate that, but he had mentioned there was ten thousand for two mobile radios and then the HVAC replacement. And I think we had that's where Mike and I had worked from there with the what the dollar man is, but we'll circle back just for clarification. That we're not talking about two different things. He he kind of indicated he had some flexibility in the, the numbers, so I'd like to take advantage of that if we could. Okay.
Okay. Anybody else with any questions? Nope. All right. Final one for this one. Yes, this was the increase from 500 to 750 for firefighters pension. Yep. So if approved, we would have to go to council for an actual approval separate from the budget. Um, this provides, so our proposed budget has a $35,000 contribution to the pension. Um, app, uh, participants put $500 or so the fund, each qualifying participant has 500, right? So for, for each participant, we allocate $500. Um, basing it on 45 participants for the allocation, we estimate 22,500 of that $35,000. So the remainder stays in the plan. If you're gonna increase it to 750, and again, it would be a separate action under council, we would have enough money to cover that 22, you know, if you added extra members, um, but there would be a small balance of 500 um, left. So in other words, there's enough money in there. If you wanted to raise the contribution to 750, the allocation of $35,000 would be enough to cover it. And I can't remember the last time this was raised, 99, it goes back a long way that they've been at the same allocation. Okay. Are, are they asking for that? Is that why this came up or? They are. They're asking for a number of things. Um, this this is one of them. Uh, the state legislature allowed an increase on the tax abatement from a thousand to fifteen hundred. So they're asking for the fifteen hundred as well. Um, however, that's not included in this budget. And they have last they have a committee that oversees this fund. That, the firefighters have a committee that oversees this fund. There's a, well, we oversee the fund, but they have representatives that attend the meetings. At, uh, we meet quarterly. Seems like there's a significant amount of money in that fund. Is, is it underfunded or overfunded or just right? Depends upon if you ask in before COVID or after COVID. It took a pretty big hit, it took a 20% drop uh, as a result of COVID. Um, I think we're on track of where we should be. There was funding in excess of the participants' balances, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know where it stands today, but there was, I mean, I get that for you. There's about a million seven, I think, in the fund, Tom. Right. Which, is there uh, some kind of statement that we see that how much is going in and out each year or? Oh yeah, we yeah. Uh, the the pension committee the, for the plan meets quarterly and gets reports, um, and we maintain here in finance we maintain the records of the participants and what the participant balances are. So if you get a good year, you get your five hundred dollar allocation. You get interest, you know, at a at a specified rate based on the earnings of the of the plan assets, um, and then there can be an extra special allocation if the earnings are above four percent. Someday when we're bored, not talking about budgets, I'd like to peruse that document. Sounds exciting. Yeah. Mayor, in fairness, he said one day when we're bored. So that means I'm out. You guys let me know what happens. I'm never bored. <laughs> OK. Thanks for running down all those questions that we asked, not only of Thursday, but uh, also over the weekend, um, Gary and Mike. Very much appreciated. Um, did anybody else have any concerns or, or questions where we are, where we stand with 
you know, fund balances, uh, pension obligations, um, mortality rates, health insurance. I'll throw it all out there. All the questions that have been circulating through my mind. Hey, uh, Mike, did we ever get an answer on the IT expenditures and whether that for the amount that was budgeted and that was spent? No, that's a good question. Danny brought that up last night. Um, just looking at IT line items, you know, are a lot of these, are they all contractual or are they upgrades? Which one? That's what I'm getting. Dan, you can obviously chime in and ask further questions. Let me just, so one of the line items was on IT expenditures, support services, I believe. And I was looking at the year to date, you know, what has been spent versus the budget amount. And it seems like there was still a million, million and a half left to be spent. And I was wondering what that entails. Is that some uh, expense we owe where we have to pay an annual maintenance fee or something? Or is that for new equipment? So the, uh, the, total, the total, total town budget, or sorry, department budget is only 625000 um, but what we typically do is uh, there's an equipment line. Yeah, IT equipment and software as so. well. Is it something on this page? What are you, what are you doing, Gary? I'm trying to find it. I th you said it oh. was year to date? Oh, wow. Yeah, it said IT equipment and software, and I think it said 51.3% was used. Up. Yeah, how far up, though, or where are we? Tell me, read you. What's that? All the way up to the near town manager. Oops, too far. Okay, here's town manager, town attorney. Next. Down. Right up. It's right there at the top. Data services. 603 budgeted, 6458 expended. So what we typically do is, is wait as long as we can. We've got upgrades in mind, but we, you know, because this budget is some is, you know, it's relatively tight. We like to wait as long as we can into the year and um, you know, make our purchases at the end of the year from the equipment line. So is, I mean, but just thinking for, you know, to be fiscally conservative slash responsible on that, the say they don't purchase new hardware, what impact does that have on moving forward next year using the same computers and hardware we're using today? If you don't buy new equipment that you need? Well, I'm saying, do you need it or are these upgrades? It's like, you know, is this simply moving from one PC to another one? No, this could be, I mean, what we're focused on from this line at the moment is getting machines upgraded from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and uh, the, the office upgrade as well, whatever that, that's, I don't know if it's Office 20 or 13 or whatever it is, but the the Microsoft Office upgrade. Um, typically what we've done with any money left in IT at the end of the year is transferred that to the IT reserve um, with an eye towards, we've done a number of, we've done some, some significant network upgrades over the last few years, um, all with an eye towards um, eventually replacing the phone system and having funds available for that. So we're not, we're not, we have, uh, we have desktops that are seven, 
six, seven years old that we're taking the spinning drives out of and putting in solid state drives, doing a, you know, probably $200, $300 or upgrade, you know, maybe some memory too. And, you know, with Windows 10, we're finding those machines will be good for, you know, we expect those will be good for another three or four years. So we're not, we're not just replacing things because they're old. Um, we replace things because they're slow and unproductive, um, upgrade those. And, you know, another thing we've spent money on is, you know, there's been an increasing demand for laptops and mobile devices. So that affects this, this line too. And I believe because we're increasing, you know, we're upgrading systems, WAN network, uh, we're looking at making sure systems are compatible with the new upgrades. Um, network, I'm assuming, you know, the big issue that we're having right now is across the world is network susceptibility and uh, the ability of being vulnerable or the issue with being vulnerable. Uh, a number of communities have seen um, phishing and spam opportunities where you know, a local municipality was almost out the door two million dollars so it's all kind of tied to as you increase your firewall you increase your systems or you improve your systems you need to have you need to have your computers follow suit oh, makes sense to me i just looking for a clarification on it i'm looking at in the uh the binder Digital back office internet services. It's about a ten thousand dollar increase from three thousand to thirteen thousand for internet services. What in particular is that? Um, Mike, if you take those three, those four lines, I think if you take those yeah. four, and add them together, four lines and add them together, they just got reallocated because we we renewed. Got the it. So the okay. way that the bid came in, they they kind of put the money on different lines. But you, so you if, take the, if you recall from the from January when the, the council approved the uh, the fiber network renewal, um, we are paying a couple hundred bucks less per year um, for the next seven years than we you know than we paid five years ago. You know, so okay. we're basically yeah. flat, but that, but that's there's just a, a shuffle between lines. Shuffle. There. Gotcha. I see the ten thousand, and then you just move around some of them, the other numbers. Got it. Okay. Um, nothing else really stands out there. Okay, anybody else with any questions, concerns about some items? Mayor, may here? I ask a question? Yes, did you hear me? I did not hear you, sorry. Oh. Um, sorry. Thank you. Uh, to the town manager, did you ask the library director uh, what kind of an impact a $50,000 cut would have on her budget? I can't remember. Did I ask you that at the last meeting? I did not. Would you, would you ask the library director what kind of an impact $50,000 cut would have on her budget? Yep. Um, and then could you also, um, maybe for the next meeting, um, would you give us kind of a breakdown of the $110,000 bucket truck light for the light replacement purchase versus um, the annual payment for outsourcing of that service. And did we get the answer from, uh, you know, get more information from um, director of physical services about why the, um, tree trimming truck can't be used for light replacement because obviously we don't want to use a fire truck that are emergency services vehicles but if we could use the tree trimming truck that would be a good alternative but if we can't 
I'd like um, to be able to weigh the, the two possible scenarios that we have. Um, and then the last question I had was, if you would please um, show us the cost difference between purchasing the vehicles that we have in our current budget versus um, leasing them, what those kind, like what a lease payment would look like, how long it would be um, for, I think it's the, the bucket truck, there's a Jeep, there was a van, there were a couple of, I don't know if I'm missing something. Um, Jeep, a van, know, and the bucket truck. I think everything else I had taken out, but I'll take a look. Okay, and it, it, I'd be interested to see, um, you know, what, what's the lease cost for each police vehicle as well. I, I am concerned if we don't buy any cruisers this year and we anticipate next year's budget to be worse than this year's, potentially not purchasing cruisers for two years, I think is a big hit for the police department. Um, so I was just wondering what it would look like if we either purchased two vehicles or did a lease for two vehicles this year or next, if, if you know, counselors feel that four is just out of the question. Um, so if, if I could have some of that information for tomorrow night, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, um, I do have some preliminary information um, in terms of the use of the Elect, uh, the, the tree trimming uh, truck, but I'll kind of plug it into the deeper scenario that you were talking about. Um, but I have the number of calls for service and how often it was used and how many trees were taken down using it. And um, I'll, I'll kind of plug that into um, the deeper, uh, like a cost, a return on investment calculation. Thank you. And how, I don't know how much information you have on, um, the actual use need, I don't know what the right terminology is, uh, for the replacement of the light bulbs. How many times did we bring a consultant in? How many light bulbs did he change yep. last year? I have that too. Is this, yeah, is this a weekly, monthly occurrence? That would all be great information. Thank you. Yep, I have it. Can I just ask a question? Did, and I didn't see this anywhere, but did, is, it, is it listed somewhere that we're cutting 50,000 from the library? No, no, I just know that in past years, there's been a number, 25 would be a good number to ask too. Um, you know, I just, I like to try to understand what kind of impacts we're having when we, you know, make potential cuts. So, um, no, I'm not suggesting we should cut the library 50. Um, I'm just wondering what that kind of a cut looks like. I mean, I would do that across the board. I would do that to every department. I already have. Do you want the information? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I looked, I looked through every, I went, met with every department head and went through every department budget as to what the impacts would be based off of certain cut levels. The only one I don't have a detail on is library because uh, they have a board and, and, um, and a director. Um, but I'm more than happy to. Okay. Kevin? Thanks. Um, I don't know if, if Mike O'Neill, if, if he's still on, if he could, uh, or, or Gary, if you know, if, if the insurance number has moved at all since the last time we have uh, we met. It has not. Thank you. And recall, we're, uh, the cap is 3% on the lap policy, Kevin, and we've budgeted a 2% increase. So we're kind of hedging our bets a little bit there, but uh, um, we have not gotten any, any update on that renewal. Okay. And then have we gotten an update on um, revenue coming in? I mean, are we are we realizing any downturn in revenue at all because of what we're faced with right now with COVID going on? Be it 
across the board anything that may give us an indication that <clears throat> the summer is not going to be that good and that going into the fall <clears throat> will even be worse. Tax revenue, um, people building permits, um, applications, any of those things? Are we seeing a trend at all? I know it's only. Yeah, those, I know, uh, Mike, I don't ago. know if you have those handy. I, I don't have the actual in front of me right now, but those numbers are all trending upwards in terms of the number of permits that we have. I'm not sure where the dollar amount is. It's probably where we were in, we anticipated. Um, I can tell you that the building department, I know Dolores is on the line, town clerk's office. Um, they've seen, they haven't seen the dip, knock on wood. I don't want to see the dip, um, but the volume has been the same, if not higher, uh, in these departments. Uh, I know Peter Gillespie is still getting phone calls from developers and businesses that are interested in doing, um, on taking action. I, you know, I think there's a, there's people who might be well positioned for this market, um, as, as terrible as it may be, um, that there's, there may be some opportunities, uh, both for residential and, um, commercial, uh, property owners. Um, you know, it's not beneficial to everyone, but there may be opportunities. And I think right now with people being at home, um, and maybe that's coming to an end soon, but they're taking out permits and they're doing projects on the residential side. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Will that keep going? I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but. And I believe 275 Ridge Road. And we talked about this last night, but that's, that's coming. The tax abatement is ending. If I'm not mistaken. So we should. I have to check. And, and I, I guess that might be full realized. When we make our adjustments to the grand list, we consult with the assessor. She, okay. she she produces those numbers. So there's a you'll see on page A2 an offset for uh, abatements. Um, but she she gives us those numbers. So there's no there's no guessing on the part of finance. And I don't see it broken out specifically here. No. Um, yeah, I can't find it. I was just trying to look it up quickly. Yeah, I'm looking it up too. Okay. Um, anything else anybody want to uh, discuss or throw out there for some ideas for, uh, for Mike and for uh, Gary? No? Okay. Well, we got a couple more questions. I think Tom and I are probably going to try and get on a call hopefully with you guys soon on a couple other things. So um, let us know tomorrow what works for you, Gary. Yep, I'll send a, I'll send a couple options around. Mayor, will you remind us what's the schedule like? Tomorrow we're meeting to go over um, items again like this, and then when's the budget adoption? Have you decided on that? Um, I think we can go with a budget adoption on the 29th. What's that, what's, I gotta look at my phone. Is Friday. The, uh, Friday. Oh, Friday? Okay. Well, it's. At six, are you thinking, what time are you thinking? Uh, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> what is that? Friday, Friday night. 
That's yeah. what he said. Hey, I, um, I know enough like to do things. I mean, if you wanted to do a back to back, we could do how quickly we turn something around for Thursday night, Gary. Um, Look at Mike O'Neill's face. Yeah, I thought. <laughs> the smiling. It depends on how many changes. Right. But, you know, I mean, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll make it work, whatever you got. Mayor, I'm giving you a hard time Friday. No. I don't have an no. issue with Friday. I was just taken aback. It's no, 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 no concerns. I, I mean, I, it's not like I'm going anywhere. Um, the only other would be to do the six o'clock before Monday's seven o'clock meeting. How is the agenda looking for Monday night? You've got uh, one grant application, two, we've got a couple things on there. Um, I think we have two con one or two contracts, definitely one, possibly two contract agreements, and then uh, a grant uh, um, acceptance of funding. It might be easier to target Friday. Yeah, I, if you wanted to take a if you want to take a tally, I say Friday. I agree, Friday. Okay, what, what time were you thinking? Same time, six o'clock. If you want to do earlier, so we could enjoy a Friday night after uh, seven o'clock. Um, let me just see. Um, we could, you want to do five o'clock Friday night? Try and get this up over um, with early. That's right. I'm available. Sounds good. Five o'clock. Mike, you're thinking we might be able to, if we deliberate tonight and then get something for Friday night? Yep. Okay. Good. We'll okay. do that tomorrow night, six o'clock, and then Gary for uh, a notice. Why don't we do five o'clock? Friday night. I know Dolores is here and so she's going to make sure I don't miss it. Actually, Cheryl's probably on the line too, making sure. But I got it in the calendar for Friday. <clears throat> Five o'clock. I know. Typically, we don't do any, you know, budget adoption on a Friday night, but we usually don't stare at each other on computer screens doing these either. So we're in a different time. And I think, Dan, you may be the first person in Connecticut or in uh, Weathersfield history to have, take an oath via a Zoom meeting. And you do know we are, <laughs> the, we are the oldest town in the state of Connecticut, so that says it all. Yeah, keep the history going. Good, okay. I think uh, we can adjourn. If anybody else had anything, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure everybody's good. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Uh, for you, Mike. Work on some figures. Excuse me, Matt. I'll make a motion to adjourn if that's what you need. Did, did sure. If you want to make a motion to adjourn, I think we got I, everybody. Did Mary and Kevin have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, thanks. And just. Um, so I mean, if we're if we're going to be voting Friday again, I hate to harp on it, but are, are we going to get some notice on, on what we're actually we're going to be voting on on Friday, like a period of time, or are we just going to walk in? I hate to harp on it, but 
we're going to be spending 107 million dollars of taxpayer dollars i'd like to get a chance to to look at it first um how do they typically i mean the i have last year's numbers that were presented to us and they were just a um what do we typically get you you get a council uh kind of like a an agenda it almost looks like an agenda item with motions that says yep. you know, this line item to that line item this line item to that line item um you know i think after i know mike's looking for his unmute screen but i'll let him go and then i'll give a suggestion if you look at the first four pages behind the additional information tab We'll also get those four pages, which will show the the proposed budget and the changes by line. I guess my question is, 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 is when we'll be getting that? Um, let's see. The one I have from last year actually goes into even further detail. It says May 14th, 19th. And then the uh, time stamp on it was 6.30. So I think at least with this agenda from last year, I don't even, Mike, if you remember, or Gary, you were on uh, staff at that time. Was this given to us, the whole entire council, that night? You, usually um, you have a, a session where you can make uh, changes to, to your documents and what you want to take off and what you want to put on. And then that is before you actually set the, set the budget so that, the, that might and Gary know which things you want to cut, which things you want, and where you want to be with the end of your budget. Okay. And then you have, after you set your session. And then you have those questions that get answered. And then they fill out those documents and then you can just read through them. But you have, you usually have the opportunity beforehand to see some of those changes. Gotcha. So we may see that tomorrow night or we would give the recommendations tomorrow night and then you guys could show it to us Thursday or Friday. Yeah. Usually that you would have some, you would see things and you'd have to give them direction as to what you want them to do so that they can get those ready for you. Okay. So to answer your question, Kevin, we'd probably get something finalize tomorrow night and then get something to the council Thursday or early time on Friday in advance of Friday night. All right. I, I appreciate that. I know it's, it's, it's tight. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, the, the longer we all have eyeballs on it, the better. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember getting this. I'm looking at last year's motions for the adoption in my notes. I was literally taking notes on the fly as they were coming in to me. So, um, and this was done at, I remember Mike running up and down <laughs> office <laughs> with different copies last year, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, this one was the, the sick free version. So it was literally hot off the presses at vote last year. Try not to do that this year. Occupational hazard. Yep. Well, well, Gary, well, you and Mike are both in the uh, office, so you'd be able to do that if need be. Okay. I just have a quick question before we adjourn. Um, 
because we do have such a t compressed time frame if we want to kind of get everything at least all our ideas and what we want um you know to to be voting on friday so gary you mentioned you had um already gone to all the departments to sort of feel them out for um what they you know what their budgets would look like if they had to cut a certain amount i i are you going to be sending that to us by email or i just want to make sure we can kind of see and digest it before tomorrow if you already have it all compiled that was your that was provided last week the memo what? that had the scenarios oh that was it oh i thought but that doesn't even have all the departments it's just a few the, so the scenarios is what you were referring to this isn't something new that you did correct if you look oh. at if you look at most of the departments there's not you know you can take 250 here you know it's you're you're basing it off of kind of a it's it's thin um so you look at the ones that um that are still operational and i came up with some scenarios of what it would look like and what you would potentially what would be impacted based off of it but i did ask every department head in my first round uh when i was doing cuts to give me uh three five i can't remember i changed it but it was three five and seven percent reductions um and they basically a lot most of them become in, inoperable after three you know when you look at five it's okay here's what the here's what we do and here's what we will not not be able to do anymore um okay i i so you okay i mean i think maybe you could have gone down i know that just looking at the budgets and looking at even the year-to-date expenses there's you know some of the departments seem to be right on track exactly you know they're going to be you know they then some are it's just such a wild difference so um uh, but i you know maybe and i and I, I agree with that but i remember we're we still have a month to go and we have a lot of invoices that haven't been paid yet. So even the ones that have that wild gap start to shrink a little bit. And then when you get to the end of the year and you look to see who's over and under and there's always something. So it's, I mean, I can, we can trim, I can trim. You can give me a number and I'll come through and I'll make, I'll make it happen. Um, it's, there's, there's a point where it's a point of diminishing return with most of the departments. Okay, thanks. I, I thank you for clarifying that. I, I thought I misunderstood when you said you had gone to all the departments. Just I didn't know you were referring to this scenarios. Yep. May I just say that I think last year what we did was um, on May 8th, we requested specific scenarios from the town manager and the finance director. And then on May 13th, we, we reviewed the different scenarios and tweaked them a little. And then May 14th, we voted on the tweaked scenarios. So we did have, um, I believe, and I, I could have, you know, Dolores check back, but I believe we did um, have a meeting where we had some different scenarios. I think, um, I think the then Councillor um, Hurley said the scenarios weren't deep enough, if I recall correctly, the ones that we had requested um, town staff prepare. And there was some discussion on the scenarios um, at that May 13th meeting, and then we voted on the 14th. Okay, so we could do that tomorrow night. Well, we'd have to. Some, you know, you, you, and, and Tom, and, and whoever would have to come up with some specific, you know, come up with some requests and some request specific scenarios that town staff can start to prepare, and then those scenarios can be reviewed, you know, if one of them is a certain percentage off department budgets or a percentage off this or that, um, you know, then town staff can work to create those scenarios for review at a, the future budget workshop. So, Mike and Gary, let's talk tomorrow. We'll do that, see what we can get on paper for the 27th, and then present scenarios for 
as quick as possible before the 29th. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn the uh, May 26th special meeting. Second. Those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Nice to have it. Okay. Nice to Thank have you everyone. guys. Take care. Thanks, Dan, welcome to the club. Welcome Thank back.